Hello friend, how are you? I'm pleased to have you in this course named Blazor Fundamentals, where you will learn the primary elements of Blazor that are going to enable you to create your own applications. I will be breaking down the details for you to understand and throughout the course we will be developing small applications for you to exercise all the knowledge we'll be covering. My name is Hector Perez, I am a Microsoft MVP and have over 10 years of experience in developing software solutions with .NET. The first step toward learning about Blazor is to understand what Blazor is. But before we answer that question, let's examine the landscape of web applications today. Typically, when we develop a server-side application, also called a backend, we use some popular platform like Java, .NET, Node.js, among many others available. This is quite common today. It is also common place to have client-side applications, which are attractive and interactive. These developments usually use a popular framework like Vue, Angular, React, etc. However, learning one or even several of these includes a learning curve that might be lengthy, considering the rapid pace things are moving at today. Ultimately, all of them generate JavaScript code, let's face it, which is somewhat slow and lacks powerful features provided by languages such as C Sharp or Java. Adding to this, if we remember what we have seen previously, the languages and frameworks used for the backend and frontend are completely different, meaning you can't use the same language for the backend and the frontend. This implies that you will inevitably have to learn working with JavaScript, either pure JavaScript or with some framework. Well, that ends with Blazor. As defined by Microsoft, Blazor is a framework for building client-side interactive web user interfaces with .NET. What does this mean? The answer is that we have a new framework that will allow us to create single-page applications. Moreover, this new framework called Blazor is simple and fun to use as it enables us to write code in C Sharp instead of JavaScript. Blazor applications are based on reusable web components that we can write with C Sharp, HTML, and CSS. We will delve into this topic later. Similarly, both client and server logic are written in C Sharp, which enables code and library sharing. Finally, Blazor is a feature of ASP.NET. As a fun fact, the name Blazor is a combination of the words browser and razor, which is the language we will use in Blazor and discuss in depth in future lessons. In order to carry out the different practices that we will conduct in throughout this course, it's necessary for us to install the Visual Studio 2022 IDE. So, we'll go to a browser and search for the term Visual Studio 2022. The first result this term gives us is the main page where we can download Visual Studio. Once we've reached the main download site, we'll proceed to click on the link that says Download Visual Studio and select the Community 2022 version, which is the free version of Visual Studio that we can use for our development work. Once we click on the link, it will initiate the download process for the Visual Studio installer, which is what we see on the screen will click on the downloaded file. This will initiate the update and installation process for the installer itself. Ok, we see this window appear on our screen. We'll click on the continue button to start the installation. This begins the process of downloading any existing updates for Visual Studio and previous versions. Once the installer is updated, we'll wait a few seconds for it to display the next window. Once the next window is displayed, we see various options to select during this installation process. Firstly, we have this section called Workloads, where we can select the different features we want to install as part of Visual Studio. These depend on the types of projects we will be developing on a daily basis. In our case, since we'll be working with Blazor, we need to select the workload named ASP.NET and web development. 
Here I'm enlarging the screen a bit so that you can better appreciate this workload. Once we've selected the workload we're going to work with, we can move on to the next tab called Individual Components, where we could select some components we might want to install, but in a customized and individual way. Here, for example, we have various frameworks we could install. We have tools related to Azure, we have tools related to, for instance, Git for Windows, etc. The next section, Language Packs, allows us to install language packages for Visual Studio 2022, in case we don't want to use the default language. For example, we could remove the English option and select a different one. In our case, we're going to retain the English default option, and we could also select what are the different installation locations for the various components that will be installed. We're going to leave this with the default paths, or at least that's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to proceed to click on the install button. I recommend that you check that the total space requested is appropriate or that you have sufficient space for the installation of these components or Visual Studio as such. We're going to click on the install button to begin the installation process, and we will give it several minutes to download and install the components on our PC. After a few minutes, you can see that the installation process has finished. Here, you'll be prompted to sign in with a Microsoft account so that a product license key can be generated for you to use it free of distractions later on. Likewise, when you sign in, it means that the configuration you use will be saved to that email account, allowing you to sync amongst different Visual Studio installations, where you sign in with that same email account. So, I'm going to quickly log in. After we have entered our credentials, this window will appear, providing us with various options to use Visual Studio 2022. In our case, we're interested in clicking on the option that says Create a new project, to initiate a new project based on Blazor. Simply, in the search bar at the top, we need to look for the term Blazor. This will display various templates associated with the use of Blazor applications. We have two options here that are available to use in Visual Studio 2022. Firstly, a Blazor Web Assembly option, and secondly, a Blazor Server App option. Going forward, we will explore the differences between each of these templates, but to show you what a Blazor created application looks like, we will select this first template, called Blazor Web Assembly App. We will proceed to click on Next then give it a specific name, for example, Blazor WebAssembly Demo. It's a bit of a long name, but it will help us distinguish these specific projects later on. Once we have changed the name, click on Next. This takes us to a second screen for additional information. Here, we can select the framework we're going to use. In our case, we'll select the latest version, which is .NET 6.0. We can also indicate if we want some type of authentication for our application, if we want to configure it for HTTPS, if we want the application to be hosted in ASP.NET Core, and if we want to convert this application into a PWA application. Don't worry about these concepts right now. We will simply click on the Create button to create our solution and our Blazor-based project. Once the project has been created, don't worry about what appears in the Solution Explorer. What I want you to do is to click on this green button that says Blazor Web Assembly Demo, which will launch our application in a browser. We then click on this large button that we have at the top. In case this message that we see here appears, this is happening because we have chosen to use HTTPS. Therefore, we are being asked if we want to trust this certificate that has been self-signed. So, we click on Yes to avoid any kind of problem. Again, we click on Yes to install this certificate.
The next thing that happens is that Visual Studio launches the application in a browser, the browser that we have pre-configured in Visual Studio. We have here a message that says loading. What this is doing is popping up this message indicating that the application is loading. After waiting a few seconds, we see that the application has been successfully launched. Congratulations, you have your first Play Store based application running in the browser. Let's take a look at the application. On the left side, we have a menu that displays different pages to which we can navigate. Firstly, we have a page called Home, which shows us the beginning of the application. It displays a Hello World message. We have a subtitle here, and we also have a message asking us if we want to give any feedback to the Blazor team. Secondly, we have a second page called Counter, which allows us to press a button that will subsequently increase the label of the current numbering. Finally, we have a third page named Fetch Data that simulates the retrieval of the weather for different dates and some type of temperature along with a summary for each of them. It is a simple application, but it will allow us to perform various demonstrations in subsequent videos. In this video, you're going to learn how to use Visual Studio Code to work with Blazor. We will conduct this exercise or demonstration from scratch using a virtual machine, so that you can follow step by step if you ever need to work with Blazor from Visual Studio Code. Although throughout the course we will be working solely with Visual Studio 2022, it's still beneficial to learn how to work with Blazor from Visual Studio Code. Ok, we have a terminal screen up, and if we endeavor to type the command.net, we find that this command is not recognized as part of the commands installed in our operating system. So, what can we do to install the .NET 6 framework and start working with Blazor? Well, we're going to open a new browser window and search for .NET 6. This will take us to the main download page for the latest iteration of the framework, in this case, .NET 6.0. We're going to first install the SDK. You need to install the SDK for your corresponding operating system. In my case, I'll be installing it for Windows X64 version. So I click on this link. The download for this installer is then initiated. Once the download has finished, let's click on the installer to execute the appropriate installation. All we need to do here is to click on the button saying install. Grant the permissions requested and this will initiate the installation process. Once we have completed the installation process, we click on the close button. Return to the previous page, that is, the page containing .NET downloads, and having installed the SDK, we will now install the ASP.NET Core Runtime. For this, we're going to select the installer corresponding to your operating system again. In my case, I'm going to choose the x64 option and will install this application once more. We click on this checkbox to indicate we agree with the terms and conditions and then click Uninstall. Ok, the installation has been completed successfully. I will now click on Close. If I return to the terminal and type .NET again, we can see it still shows the term or the command .NET is unrecognized. This is because we need to restart any cancel where we want to run this command from the installation we have performed. I will then open a new terminal. Once we've opened this new terminal, we'll type .NET again, and note that we now have different options indicated by the cancel that we can use to work with the .NET command. This means that we now have different templates installed and everything necessary to create Blazor-based applications. How can we check this? Well, as part of our cancel, we can type .NET space new space dash dash list 
This will display all the templates we have installed at the moment. Remember, we have not installed Visual Studio, we've only performed the installation I've previously shown you. This is already showing us different templates that we have available to create various projects. We have the short name with which we could create this project, different language selections and labels for applying any type of filter. Next, we will simply create a new project based on Blazor WebAssembly. Here we can see that we have the different options for creating Blazor-based applications. If we want to create a new project based on a Blazor server, we would need to write this term. If we want to create an application based on WebAssembly, we would need to use this other term. So, we return to our cancel and we will type .NET New Blazor Wasm, which is the name of the template we have chosen. We will specify a end parameter to indicate that we want to apply a name to the project or rather to the folder where the different files of our project will be hosted. You can specify any name you want. In my case, I will use Blazor Wasm Demo. Where will this project be hosted? Well, it will be hosted at this path that we are specifying or at the one we are located at and a new folder called Blazor Wasm Demo will be created which will contain all the files of our solution. We press enter. This initiates the project creation process. Notice that here it is indicating that this project was successfully created. We have this path that we had previously. We have the new folder that has created due to the parameter we specified. And here we already have specified what is the csproj file that will contain our project as such. Once we have created our project, we need some tool that allows us to view the code, edit it and run the applications. We are talking about Visual Studio Code. I will proceed to a new browser window. I will write Visual Studio Code. This will take us to the first link, which is the main page of Visual Studio Code. We simply have to click on the button to download the installer. Once it has downloaded, we will proceed to run it. We accept the terms and conditions. We leave the default path selected. We also leave the default value for the shortcut. Here you can select different options according to what you want to accomplish once you start working day to day. For instance, you can indicate that you want to add this option when you deploy the context menu in Windows Explorer. I'll select these couple of options that are deselected by default, click on next and finally on the install button. After I have finished installing Visual Studio Code, I will indicate that I do not wish to launch Visual Studio Code. Click on Finish, go back to the terminal, and from the terminal, I can now write the name of the application's executable, that is, Code. I leave a space, write the name of the folder, Blazor Wasm Demo, and if I press the Enter key, we see that it indicates this command is not recognized. This happens again because we need to restart the console. I will proceed to write code again. I press enter again. What we've done with this instruction is to indicate that we want to open Visual Studio Code and within Visual Studio Code, the content of the folder Blazor Wasm Demo, which was the folder we created when we developed the project itself. Let's then see the project in Visual Studio Code. Note that we have here the folder we previously created, all the components related to this project, and to test this project, we need to open a new terminal. Within the terminal, run the .NET watch command. We press the Enter key. This starts the compilation and deployment process of this application. As you can see, we have successfully deployed the same application that we have deployed from Visual Studio 2022. 
we have the same functionalities, the same behavior, but we have done everything from Visual Studio Code. So I want this video to serve as a reference in case you ever need to work with Blazor from Visual Studio Code. Blazor is a web framework that comes in two versions to choose from, that is, two ways in which it can be executed. The first way is to be executed on the client side in a web browser, in a .NET runtime environment based on something called WebAssembly. The second way is to be executed on the server side in ASP.NET Core. Regardless of the hosting model, the application models and components are exactly the same. Next, we'll talk about these hosting models in a little more detail. Let's first talk about Blazor WebAssembly. To understand this hosting model, we first need to know what WebAssembly is. Here's a bit of history. In 1995, JavaScript was created by Brendan H. Since its potential reach was unknown, it was not created with many considerations in mind. Over time, it became undisputedly the primary tool for web usage. Nevertheless, even today, there are issues regarding achieving native performance with it. Over the years, solutions such as Adobe Flash, Java Applets and Silverlight have emerged to address this issue. However, since they needed to be installed as plugins by users, they weren't an integral part of browsers, leading to their eventual disappearance. All this experience led to unprecedented collaboration between the W3C consortium, Google, Apple, Mozilla and Microsoft resulting in WebAssembly, an open standard for executing binary code in most browsers, with almost native performance and without a need for additional plugins. Since it's a well-defined format, any programming language can target WebAssembly as a compile option. As a result, today there are around 40 high-level programming languages that support WebAssembly, such as C, C++, Python, Go, Java, PHP, C Sharp, among others. Taking the above into consideration and using WebAssembly as a foundation, it is possible to add the well-known runtime of .NET, which will allow us to execute any DLL compatible with .NET. Lastly, Blazor is the framework that will allow us to write HTML, CSS and c -sharp code, which, when working in conjunction with the .NET framework and WebAssembly, allows us to create nearly native client-side experiences. This experience is known as Blazor WebAssembly. Speaking of the features of this type of project, we can list the following. Firstly, all resources are downloaded to the browser. This means that the HTML, CSS and JavaScript files, if any, are downloaded to the browser. Additionally, the .NET runtime along with each file of the application or required class libraries are also downloaded. The .NET runtime runs on WebAssembly providing an environment where once the application is downloaded, an internet connection is not required. If we had to enumerate some cans of Blazor WebAssembly, they would be as follows. First, as the browser runs the entire application, we are restricted by its capabilities. Similarly, as the .NET runtime and all class libraries are downloaded, this creates a longer resource download time. Also, since all the information is downloaded to the browser, it would not be advisable to store sensitive information such as passwords in these types of applications. Lastly, as WebAssembly is relatively new, very old browsers may not be capable of running Blazor WebAssembly type applications. The second hosting model is called Blazor Server. In this model, the resources are processed by the server and not .NET component or .NET runtime is downloaded. It focuses more on creating lightweight clients, that is, small applications that download quickly to the browser. Connection with the server in real time is achieved through a signal art connection using WebSockets. Lastly, because it runs on the server, it has access to the complete ASP.NET framework. The main benefits of this scheme are, first, it does a small download. It has access to the complete ASP.NET framework, 
WebAssembly is not required, therefore even older browsers can run these types of applications. And finally, we can access databases and store keys in a more secure way. But we also have some disadvantages. First, we don't have support for offline connections. This means we must always have an active internet connection. Similarly, we will definitely need an ASP.NET Core server to run the application. Also, due to the requirement of a constant connection to the server, the application will be slower than Blaze or WebAssembly. This doesn't mean that the application will run slowly. We may not even notice the speed difference, but a Blaze or WebAssembly application will always run faster than a Blaze or server type application. Now that we have theoretically reviewed both hosting models, let's examine them in a practical way. We're back in Visual Studio 2022. We're going to open the project we previously created called Blazor WebAssembly Demo. Let's click on the project. Once we've opened this project, we're going to create a new instance of Visual Studio 2022. Next, we'll click on Create New Project. This time, we'll select a template. If we apply the Blazor filter, we'll select this template called Blazor Server App. Let's change the name to Blazor Server Demo. Then, click on Next. We we'll leave the default options and finally, click on Create. This is so you can see how one application behaves in relation to the other. We we'll look more closely at how each of these projects is structured later. Right now, I just want to show you the behavior of each application in this demonstration. So, let's proceed to run the WebAssembly based application. Ok, our application is now running here. Now, I'm going to run the Blazor server based application. We have both applications running side by side. We see that they have exactly the same design, the same pages, and the same behavior. What's the difference between these two applications? I'll show you a notable difference. I'm going to open a couple of windows in the Chrome browser, which is a different browser than Edge, which I'm currently using. This is because if I stop the project from Visual Studio, both windows will automatically close. So I will proceed to copy the URL of each application into a new window of the Chrome browser. Here I have the WebAssembly based application. I'll copy the URL of the Blazor server based application. Once I've loaded both applications, take a look at what will happen when I stop Visual Studio for each project. I return to Visual Studio for the WebAssembly project and I will proceed to stop this application. I'll do the same for the Blazor server based project. Minimize these windows and let's see what has happened. On the left side, we have the Blazor WebAssembly application running. Notice that its behavior has not changed. We see that we can increase the current count. And yet, on the right side, we've lost this connection to the server, which I discussed during the slides. If we lose this server connection from our application, the client side connection simply disappears and we no longer have communication to update our graphical interface. Meanwhile, in the WebAssembly based application, we have a fully functional application, except for this page that lets us simulate getting the weather data. And this is due mostly to how the HTTP client works behind the scenes. But concerning the application itself, it's still functioning without any issues. Meanwhile, for the Blazor server application, we can't do anything at all because we don't have an active connection to the server. Once we've observed the difference in behavior between these two templates, let's analyze the structure of a Blazor WebAssembly template. This is for you to understand the step-by-step -step process that is carried out when you launch an application based on this type of templates. In the following video, we will analyze the Blazor server template, and I believe it's important for you to know the purpose of each file in your project.
we have our project called Blazor WebAssembly Demo, which is the one we created in one of the initial videos. We have different folders, some that you may recognize and others that you might not utilize. The first thing I want you to notice is this section called Dependencies. These are the different dependencies that you have or that are part of your project. The interesting part here is that we have this NuGet Packages section. As part of this NuGet Packages section, we have two packages that reference components related to WebAssembly. Currently in version 6.0.1 specifically. Perhaps your version number is different if you're viewing this course at a later date. The second thing we can notice as part of the project is our folder called Properties. We have a file called LaunchSettings.json, which is well known if you've worked with ASP.NET Core projects before. For those who don't know, this is a file that describes the application settings, which is how it will start, how the application will behave when you're using Visual Studio. This file is only used during the project development, since when the application is published on Microsoft Azure, for instance, this file will be ignored. You can even see that we only have references to localhost. After this folder called properties, we have a folder named www root, which basically contains the static files that will be part of our project. We have different CSS files that contain, for example, bootstrap styles. We also have various styles here for using icons through a font called Open Iconic. We have the app.css stylesheet, which is standard CSS code, nothing different from the styles you've surely created before if you've worked with web development. I'm going to close this file, and next we have a folder here called sample data, which contains a JSON file. This is the file we used to obtain that fictitious weather information on the page we have already seen in the demonstration. We have different files like favicon.ico, the icon in PNG format, and a page called index.html. You can see that this page is an HTML page, just like any other page. As part of this file, we have different tags, such as meta tags, title tags, link tags, which refer to different style sheets. Part of our body section, we have two very important sections. This first div, identified as app, is what will be replaced by the content of our application or the current page we are viewing. We have a section that will display the error message in case an error is found. Lastly, we have a script tag with a reference to a file called blazor.webassembly.js. This file is very important as it will handle the download of the .NET framework as well as all the dependencies we need to run our Blazor WebAssembly application. Next, we have a folder called Pages. We have three pages here, as their name suggests, the pages that we have seen in previous demonstrations. A page named Counter, a page called Fetch Data, and a page known as Index. Don't worry about the content of these files right now, we will explore them later on. Next, we have another folder called Shared. Basically, this folder contains various components that aren't directly navigable, meaning we can't preview these components quickly in a browser. But they are components that can be used within other components. For example, we have a component called nav menu. As you may have guessed, this serves as the component responsible for the navigation part on the left side of our application. We have another component that asks us if we want to leave any feedback for the Microsoft team about the Blazor runtime or the Blazor project. Following that, we have a file called imports.razor and this file essentially allows us to define a series of namespaces that will be used throughout the application, so we don't have to specify different namespaces in each of the files. By defining the namespace in this file, 
we can automatically use all the components found within the same namespace throughout the entire project. Therefore, it's a significant advantage if, for example, we have a components folder and don't want to reference them in each of the pages we create. We also have a file called app.razor, which is the so-called routing component. This file is crucial, as it will define how our application behaves in response to different page requests made by a user. This means that if the requested URL is found, a certain design will be displayed to the user, along with the information they requested. However, if the user enters information that is not valid and cannot be quickly found by the framework, then a different design will be displayed, which we can see here. We see that the tags are very descriptive, saying found in case a certain route is found and not found where a specific route has not been found. Finally, we have a file called program.cs, a well-known file in the realm of ASP.NET Core, which contains the code that starts the WebAssembly application and builds the dependency container. As part of this file, various components to be used as part of the application are added. In this instance, the routing component that we saw earlier. Here we are passing a parameter indicating that we want to get the app identifier from our file called index.html. Now let's look at the flow of this application. Another component head outlet is also added, which allows us to modify parts of our Blazor application's headers. We are also adding a service, in this case, the HTTP client based service which enables us to consume the JSON file that we saw in the sample data folder. Lastly, what is done in this file is building the project and launching it. So, what is the flow of this application? Where does it all start? Well, initially, the application is run as such. This is done through the program.cs file. For users, the first interaction is with this file called index.html, which, as we saw earlier, is responsible for the download of the .NET framework, all of the components, etc. However, in addition to this, we previously specified in program.cs that the routing component will have a parameter, an app selector, which is what we're looking at on the screen. What this allows is for our main or initial component index to load. This works in conjunction with the app.razor file, which specifies the default layout. In other words, we're indicating that main layout will be the main layout of the page we're viewing. We have this stored in the shared folder and it's called main layout. Bear in mind, this is HTML code. Here, we're indicating that we want to load nav menu, another component. This is the navigation component. We're also specifying the main section and basically indicating that we want to display the content we have as part of each page with this add body. Thus, the index.html file will be used in conjunction with main layout to replace the content of each page. Essentially, this is the flow of our Blazor WebAssembly based application. Let's now analyze a project based on Blazor server. We will find many similarities between these two templates. So, let's examine the project. We have the Blazor server demo project open, which is the project we created earlier. The first difference we can notice is that if we look at the dependencies, we don't have a section for NuGet packages by default. In other words, we don't have those files which were called WebAssembly.something that allowed us to work with WebAssembly. This is because remember that in the case of Blazor server, the server with ASP.NET Core is the one in charge of sending the application or only sending the necessary information to be rendered within a browser. We again have the launch settings.json file in the properties folder that we already discussed its use earlier. In the www root section, we don't have that sample data section we saw in the WebAssembly project. 
that JSON file allowed us to simulate obtaining weather information. This is because, as we have an application that has the full potential to use the ASP.NET Core framework, we can create endpoints within this same project to consume information and simulate the consumption of this data. What we do have is the CSS folder which is also in the WebAssembly project. In the same way, we have bootstrap styles, app and iconic, and the styles for our site, which is the style sheet that we see on the screen. Inside the data folder, we did not have this folder in the WebAssembly project actually. This is because, as I mentioned before, here we can simulate that we have an endpoint, which we can call from the same application to make different queries. We have a class called Weather Forecast, which is basically the data model of our application or of that specific page. We also have the Weather Forecast service which contains a method that will allow us to randomly fetch information to fill the table we saw in the example. Similarly, under the Pages section, we have more files than we had in the WebAssembly project. We have pages that we saw earlier such as Index, Fetch Data, and Counter. But in this specific case, we have an error page here, which as you can see, will display error messages if there was a problem while we were working with the application. Likewise, we have this underscore cost file and this underscore layout file. Within the underscore cost file, we only have that main file or main component that allows us to specify which component we're going to render. It is equivalent to the index.html file. In this case, we indicate that we want to use a component called app. Next, we have a folder called shared, which contains the same files we saw in the WebAssembly file. These are reusable components. We also have a file called imports, which we've also seen its use. It is also used in the same way in Blazor server. We have the app.razor file, which is very similar to the file we saw in the WebAssembly project. We already saw that this file provides a certain layout if it finds a specific route structure that the user enters, and it will display a different layout if the request made by the user is not found. We also have an appsettings.json file for carrying out additional configuration. Finally, there's the program.cs file. This file contains more information than the one we saw earlier in the Blazor WebAssembly project. Here, we have some very notable differences, such as, for instance, additional services are added to our application's flow. We can also specify certain behaviors when we are in development phase, because once again, we are working on the full ASP.NET Core framework. We also use HTTPS redirection, static files, routing, map blazor hub, among other options. And finally, we run the application. What is the flow of this application? Well, first we call up the script host file, which as I previously mentioned, is equivalent to the index.html file in the blazor WebAssembly project. This file we already saw earlier specifies a certain layout, it's the layout called underscore layout. It's what we're seeing here. The code is very similar to the index.html. This file specifies the section called at render body, which is where the content of each of our pages will be displayed. But not just that, within this component we're indicating that we want to use the app component, which is a routing component we saw earlier. So, what this component does is display our home page, index.razor, which is the page with the content we're seeing here. This is essentially the flow of an application created with the Blazor server template. As I mentioned earlier, don't worry if this concept seems a bit unfamiliar, or if you're still unsure about what components refer to. Let's gradually understand what these terms mean and how to use them.